Hello, so glad to be with you and that together we can look into the Word of God. I believe the Lord has quickened something to me from the Scriptures to help explain what He is doing, what He wants to do in these days, and I believe that God will speak to your heart as we look into His Word. The topic we want to look at right now is God's call for the 11th hour workers. Now, the Lord Jesus taught a parable to explain to us how he is, as the scriptures say, the Lord of the harvest, the one who will bring a great gospel harvest of men's souls to salvation. This parable we're going to read also explains to us how he is now calling for many workers who will join him in this harvest, in this work of bringing many people into salvation and eternal life. So let us read from this parable that Jesus taught in Matthew chapter 20, verses 1 through 7. For the kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out early in the morning to hire men to work in his vineyard. He agreed to pay them a denarius a day and sent them into his vineyard. And he went out about the third hour and found others standing in the marketplace doing nothing. He told them, you also go and work in my vineyard, and I will pay you whatever is right. So they went. Again he went out at the sixth and the ninth hour and did the same thing. About the eleventh hour he went out and found still others standing around. He asked them, Why have you been standing around all day doing nothing? They said to him, No one has hired us. He said to them, you also go into the vineyard, and whatever is right, you will receive. Now, the Lord Jesus taught this parable to explain to us about the timing of this harvest and about the workers who he would call to join in this salvation work. The harvest would have more and more workers brought in to gather the abundant fruit, yet that day of harvest would come to a close. The time of the harvest that Christ was speaking about is the time of the church age. From the beginning of the church until the second coming of Christ is called the day of salvation or the day of harvest. The gospel of Christ's salvation is being spread throughout the world. And the apostle Paul wrote in 2 Corinthians 6 verse 2, Now is the acceptable time. Now is the day of salvation. We are living now near the end of the church age in what can be called the 11th hour of this harvest day. The harvesting of souls will soon be over when Christ returns. Christ gave us a very specific timetable concerning his second coming in Matthew 24. In verse 3, his disciples had asked, What will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? Then, in verse 14, the Lord told them, And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in the whole world as a witness as to all nations, and then the end will come. The Lord Jesus made it clear that when the church has preached the gospel throughout the world, it will become the time for Christ's second coming. When the Lord will then rule the world as the King of Kings, and the time of the church age will be over. The harvest of souls that the worldwide church is together will have ended as the kingdom of God is ushered in throughout the world. Now, Christian missionary organizations have said that the worldwide church could finish world evangelism in less than 15 years if we become fully dedicated to this cause. That would prepare the world for the end of this age and the return of our Lord Jesus. We do not know the exact year or date when the church will finish the Great Commission. The church may be very slow in its accomplishing this. Unusual world events may help 
motivate the church and speed it up. We don't know the exact year or hour. We know, however, there's still a fair amount of work before the church will have spread the gospel throughout the whole world. And when the Great Commission is completed, then it will be the end of the church age and the harvest of men's souls before Christ's return. It's important that we understand that at the first coming of Christ, about 2,000 years ago, the Lord Jesus came as a lamb, introduced by John the Baptist in his first public appearance. John saying, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. He came as a lamb to die for the sins of the world, so that whosoever believes will not perish, but have eternal life. That was at his first coming. But he also made abundantly clear, and prophecy after prophecy from the Old Testament tells us, at his second coming, he's not coming again as a lamb. He is coming back as a lion, as the king and the judge of the world. Now is the time that Christ is offering himself as a lamb, as a savior, as one who has paid the price for our sins. But when Christ returns, he's not coming back again, meek and mild. He is coming back in flaming fire, the scripture says, to take judge justice upon the earth. He's coming back as the king of kings and the judge of all the earth. He came as a lamb the first time, the second time. He's coming back as a lion. So now is the time for people to receive the Lamb of God, the Savior. But when Christ returns, he will be the king, the lion, the judge of all who have not already turned to his salvation. And then at his second coming, the harvest season of men's souls will be over. Now there is a story that helps explain this to us. There was a young man who was arrested for many crimes. He lived a wild life. But he had a very smart uncle who was a lawyer. And every time the young man was taken to court, his uncle was able to rescue him from being sent to prison. The day finally came, however, when the young man again was brought to court for another crime he had committed. And this time, his uncle was not his lawyer pleading his case. This time, his uncle sat in the judge's bench. He was the judge of this case. And the young man thought, oh, it will be easy for him to escape a prison term this time because his uncle had always helped him before. And now his uncle had full control of the outcome of the case. He was the judge. The young man was shortly shocked when his uncle pronounced him guilty and gave him a long prison sentence. He said to his uncle, but you've always rescued me before. And now that you have full authority over my case, you send me to prison? His uncle replied, my nephew, when I was your lawyer, it was my responsibility to work on your side, to plead your case and seek to find you mercy. But now that I am your judge, it is my responsibility to stand for justice. And justice you have received. You are guilty, and you are going to prison. Now this story illustrates to us how Christ can offer mercy at this time to sinners, but the day is soon coming when he will return and bring judgment. Before that time of his second coming, now is the time when everyone can receive forgiveness, find mercy for their sins. Now is the time our souls can be saved. And now is the time that we can help bring in this harvest of lost sinners. But the harvest season for lost souls all over the world will soon be over when Christ returns. Because the Lamb is coming back as a lion. The Savior 
will soon return as the judge of the world. We need to listen to the warning of the scriptures. Now is the acceptable time. Now is the day of salvation. But that day, when salvation is offered, will end. When Christ, the lion, the king, the judge, will return. In this last hour of the harvest season, as we near the completion of the Great Commission, Christ is still wanting to save the lost. The Lord of the harvest is still gathering up the last of the harvest from around the world. And he is calling for more workers, for more harvesters, before it is too late. The harvest will soon be over. Will you hear God's last call? That you can still join the harvesters. Now at the beginning of this year, in January 2020, the Lord spoke to my wife as she was praying about what the new year would bring. The Lord spoke to her the word acceleration and said to her, this year you will see the signs of the last days accelerating. This year, world events will begin to move more quickly towards the second coming of Christ. And it is certainly true, we have seen the world change at a speed more rapidly than we would have imagined. With the coronavirus crisis covering the earth, and that bringing into instability uh, food chain supplies and and jobs, uh, uh, countless millions of jobs lost, and uh, world economies uh, being greatly battered, we find that things are changing more rapidly than we would have imagined. But God said, this is the start of the acceleration in these last days that will be bringing us into the time of our Lord's soon return. The World Health Organization says that a number of nations will soon be facing coming famines as a result of the coronavirus crisis. Many organizations and nations are facing financial crises that will become out of control. There will be increasing judgments and crises around the world to warn everyone that the time is soon arriving when the world will face the arrival of Christ the Judge. Now it is the 11th hour, just a short time left to gather in the harvest. The time for the church to preach the gospel around the world will soon be over. The day of harvest will be past. Now the prophet Jeremiah faced a similar situation to ours in his own time. When he was young, his nation prospered under the leadership of the good king Josiah. Revival came during Josiah's reign. It was a time of salvation and the harvest of souls of those who turned to God. But Jeremiah lived to see that time of revival under King Josiah fade away and soon turn into a time of destruction under the next kings of the nation that became totally corrupt and saw the destruction of the nation. When the revival Jeremiah had experienced in his younger years was over and the nation had fallen into darkness and sin and judgment was at hand, Jeremiah lamented over them, echoing the despair of these lost people. They were recorded in Jeremiah 8, verse 20, as saying, The harvest is past. The summer is ended. And we are not saved. When judgment finally fell upon Jeremiah's nation, the people were in despair. Most of them had not turned to God in that time of revival in that time of salvation, and they knew they had wasted the opportunity to be saved. It became too late. They had not called upon the Lord when he could be found. They had not sought God when he was near. And now they mournfully declared, the harvest is past, the summer is ended, and we are not saved. We are close to that same situation in our time 
today. God has been good to the people of the world, sending revival and peace and gospel preachers throughout the nations. God's mercy and long suffering has, has lingered throughout these days while the church has been spreading the gospel and completing the Great Commission. But just as the yearly seasons of the world must always change, so also the spiritual times and seasons of God must change. In the northern climates, summer will always give way to fall and then change to a bitter, barren winter. In the tropics, the rainy season will always give way, give way to the dry season of barrenness, of drought. And in the spirit, the time we are living in is that the gospel harvest season is almost over when the judgment of God will come in fullness and the peoples will cry out, the harvest is past, the summer has ended, and we are not saved. Now the end of the harvest season is the busiest time for farmers. They know if the harvest is not quickly gathered in, it will be lost. It will be spoiled. It will be wasted. Farmers will search far and wide to find more workers to bring in the harvest. Will the harvest be fully gathered and a full reward be gained? Or will much of the harvest be lost and little reward be gained? Solomon wisely declared that there is a time for every season. The tribe of Issachar was commended in David's generation as being a wise people who understood the times and knew what the nation was supposed to do. But our Lord Jesus had to rebuke the religious leaders of his time. Christ said in Matthew 16.3 that they could interpret the appearance of the weather, but they could not interpret the spiritual season of their time. When the Lord Jesus began his ministry, he declared he had come to bring Israel their time of visitation, their season of revival and salvation. As he proclaimed in Luke 4, verse 18 and 19, when he preached his first public sermon, that he had come to bring the time of the day of God's salvation. But near the end of his earthly ministry, as the Lord Jesus approached Jerusalem and saw the city, he wept over it. And he said, If you, if only you had known on this day what would bring you peace, but now it is hidden from your eyes. The day will come when your enemies will build an embankment against you and encircle you and hem you in on every side. They will destroy your city and your children with you. They will not leave in you one stone upon another because you did not know the time of God's visitation to you. That's what Jesus declared on Palm Sunday as he was coming into Jerusalem, weeping, lamenting over Jerusalem, just as Jeremiah had lamented over a past generation that had lost its opportunity. And so Jesus said, as he was being led to the cross, to the daughters of Jerusalem, don't weep for me, weep for you and for your children. Destruction is coming upon you. Calamity was coming. They had missed the day of their salvation when the Son of God came to his own and his own did not receive him. When the people of Jerusalem had cried out, one week after Palm Sunday, they cried out, Crucify him! Crucify him! His blood be upon us and on our children! That same generation found that the Roman armies eventually came, surrounded their city, and the multitudes in Jerusalem were slowly perishing of famine. 
before the Roman army broke in and killed everyone, the people in Jerusalem were probably lamenting and quoting the words that Jeremiah had written. The harvest is past. The summer has ended. And we are not saved. Now the time that we live in now will again experience this changing of the seasons when God's mercy is going to become replaced with judgment. Just as the increasingly loud rumbles of thunder coming closer and closer tell us that a storm is coming, the calamities and crises that are increasing in the world are sending us a message The storm of God's judgment is drawing nearer and nearer. The church age is drawing to a close. The day of salvation is drawing near to its sunset. It is late in the day, but the Lord of the harvest is still calling out to those who will become reapers, to those who will harvest the lost souls. Yes, it is the 11th hour. Soon the harvest will be finished, and it will be too late. Too late to follow God's call. Too late to save souls. Soon the great day of sorrow will come for the peoples of the world when they will cry out, the harvest is past, the summer has ended, and we are not saved. So now is the time that God is calling In this 11th hour, near the end of the harvest day, for workers to gather in the harvest and save souls before it is too late. Do you hear God calling to you? Do you feel the Spirit of God touching your heart as we consider these truths? Respond to the call of Jesus. God is calling to you. Respond and say to the Lord, Lord, here am I. Send me. Lord, with your help, I will join in the work to gather the harvest and bring lost souls to salvation. If that is your response to God, that you're saying, Lord, here I am. Send me, use me. Lord, you're calling for workers in this last hour. Lord, I want to save souls. I want to be part of your last hour of harvest season. If that is your heart's cry, respond to what God is touching your heart with now and let us pray together. (sighs) Heavenly Father, we have been considering from the scriptures about your calling for harvesters In this last hour, Lord, we have heard the cry of your spirit. Lord, we have felt the touch of God upon our hearts. And Lord, as the spirit of God is moving, we surrender. Lord, I surrender afresh. I surrender to your call. Lord, here I am. Use me. Lord, let me be a a laborer with Christ. Let me be one that will gather in souls for eternity, uh, eternal joy and reward. Lord, help me to be a harvester in these last days and bring much joy to those who are gathered. Help me, Lord. Seal this commitment in my heart, I pray, in Jesus' wonderful name. Amen. Now, for those of you who have responded to Christ's call, you who have made a new commitment in your heart to serve the Lord, the next question is, how can we become a worker? And so we want to quickly look at a few important steps to help you in becoming equipped to join in this great gospel harvest. Number one, learn to really pray For the lost that you seek to gather. We read in Psalm 126 verse 5 and 6. Those that sow in tears shall reap in joy. He who continually goes forth weeping. Bearing seed for sowing. He shall doubtless come again with rejoicing. 
bringing his sheaves, bringing his harvest with him. And so if we will weep for lost souls, our tears will be like the rain. It will prepare men and women's hearts. It will, it will get the harvest ready for those who go and reach out to their hearts and minds. Now, back before my wife and I were married, when she was a teenager, she went to Scotland with an evangelism team. And they went from town to town, and they would see a soul saved here, two souls saved here. But they were in one town where they saw a mighty revival. Hundreds of young people, uh, goths, and uh, 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 very uh, hardened young people uh, got their hearts broken before the cross of Jesus and turned to Christ. And... What they attributed, the difference between the towns where there were one or two that gave their lives to Christ and this other town where hundreds turned to Christ is that in that town of revival, there had been a small group of elderly that had prayed for years that God would move in power and save the young people of their town. They sowed in tears. And my future wife's team came in, preached the gospel, and they reaped with joy. But the foundation, the difference between a very small harvest and an abundant harvest was where there had been prevailing prayer to prepare the way for revival harvest. There's another example I can tell you. About 15 years ago, a mother felt to fast and pray for her wayward son to get saved. He was in the U.S. Navy, and she dedicated herself for several weeks to uh, not eat anything, only drank water, and spent every day of those weeks in prayer for her son. Her son was far out on the ocean. There was no communication by uh, Internet or media, but there was communication by her prayers. And in the middle of that time of fasting, her son met the Lord in a mighty way and turned to Christ and was saved. Well, now her son is an ordained minister and a professor at a Pentecostal university in Florida. But more importantly to me than his being a minister or a professor, he's my son-in-law, Yun Ho Shin. Prayer. Prevailing prayer for a soul, prevailing prayer for a town, for a nation, can make a great impact. And so let me encourage you, make this the foundation of your new commitment to be a worker in the harvest, to save souls. Learn to pray like never before. Get a hold of God for mercy for someone. Pray until you feel a person's heart, until you feel their pain, until you feel they are lost. And pray into them uh, the Spirit of God calling them and, 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 and showing them the reality of the salvation of Jesus. Pray, number one. Now, a next step is Go. As Jesus said in the parable, go into the highways and byways. Go and search for all the people that will come in for the salvation of Christ. Look for people you can evangelize. If you're in a situation, like now, many places in the COVID-19 crisis, a lot of places people can't move around physically, but just pull out your computer. Pull out your cell phone. You can get around the world to witness to people. Use social media to reach out to more and more people. And maybe you've had friends or acquaintances, maybe back from years ago, and maybe they haven't heard the gospel or haven't heard that message in a very long time. Now is the time. Now. They can hear and respond. Don't wait until it's too late. Pray and then share the gospel. If you're able to travel around, visit your neighbors. Speak to people you work with. 
with friends at school. My future wife was led to Christ when she was 15 years old by her high school science partner. And her partner, while they were working on the science project together, was always telling her about Jesus. And she said, oh, you know, I've, I, I know all that. I, I went to church when I was a kid. And yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and was just seemingly ignoring the science partner, but was still listening. Something inside her was listening to this message of salvation until finally the day came when she was alone in her, uh, in her house. And she said, Lord, if what my science partner is, says about you is true, I want to know you. And that day, salvation came to my future wife. So look for people that were around that we can tell about the gospel. School friends, people wherever we go. My daughter, my younger daughter, Esther, became a soul winner, led hundreds of people to Christ uh, before she... uh, turned 20 years old, and and she would go to food courts, uh, to uh, parks, to various places. You can go to bus stations, basketball courts, malls, and just look for people that are just not doing anything, just looking around for entertainment or something new, and, and pray that God will lead you to people that you can talk to and share the gospel with and even... Many times, lead them to the Savior. So number one, pray. Number two, go and share the gospel. Number three, you might join evangelistic efforts that your church organizes. Or you might help start new methods or uh, seasons in which the church will spend different ways reaching out to the lost. You might be able to organize some new gatherings in a school. Schools are often open in many nations. In jails, people in jails are often just waiting for a visitor or a music group or somebody to come and tell them something to help them in their prison. And we have the best message of how the prisoners can be set free for eternity. Go to an old folks' home or a nursing home in many nations. When I was a new Christian, I had just been a rock and roll hippie. My hair was two feet long. I felt I was called to become a a minister of the gospel, but I knew in that situation as a new Christian, nobody would let me near a pulpit to preach. So I prayed. I said, Lord, I want to share the gospel. I want to be used in your service, but... uh, My church has a thousand people. They have lots of skilled pastors. They don't don't want me to preach. What can I do? Where can I go? And God led me to look up in the phone book in my local city and call up and find two nursing homes filled with elderly people that were often sent there for medical care. Sometimes were sent there because the younger relatives just wanted to kind of get rid of them. And a lot of lonely people in these nursing homes. So we started services. And I didn't know how to preach. I'd never done that. But I had been a rock and roll guitarist and singer. I knew how to, how to play a guitar and sing a gospel song. And we learned to read the Bible and share our testimonies and preach. And people started to get saved. And it became fruitful for the old folks that got saved. It became fruitful for my team as we learned how to preach and share the gospel. But after I had gotten the invitation to start these services in two nursing homes, I decided it was probably important that I talk to my pastor because the pastor had not organized this. And I know it's important that we're under the guidance of our pastors, of our leaders. So I scheduled a meeting with him. He's a very busy man. There were a thousand people in church. But he graciously took the time, and I explained about how I had this offer to start these services in these nursing homes. And I told him, uh, I've gathered the musicians, uh, I've got the time slot, 
We don't need any money. We don't need uh, you to send in any preachers. We don't need your time or any of the pastors. All we're asking is, will you bless us? Will you pray for this? And I could almost just see the wheels turning in my pastor's head. They don't need money. They don't need my help. They don't need any of the church staff. They're just going to go and start something new and see if God will bless it. And very quickly, he, he got it all figured out. He said, sure, yes. And he prayed and blessed us. And we were off starting our ministry, learning how to share the gospel and saving souls. So you don't just have to wait for your pastor to organize something in evangelistic ministry. Now, certainly work with the church. Now, share with your pastor, make sure he feels it's wise, you have the blessing. But the pastors are so busy taking care of the sheep. Many times we are the ones that should be praying and, and finding new open doors and knocking on uh, hospitals or jails or schools and, or, or next door neighbors and, and learning how to reach out with the gospel. Now, with those evangelistic efforts, we should also study about how to become soul winners. Practice certainly helps, but study the scriptures. Get online. There's a lot of websites that share about how to share the gospel, how to become a soul winner, uh, attend classes at your church. If your church has any classes on sharing the gospel, or maybe your home group will do it. If you are a pastor or Bible study leader listening to this, pray that you will teach a new series to your church members about soul winning, going out, saving the lost, perhaps inviting them to come to your church. Let's work together. Your churches can grow stronger. You can see a harvest of souls and we can see the Lord's blessing on the growing churches if we will be doers of the word. If we in this 11th hour will dedicate ourselves to this gospel harvest. Now going on to finish this story of the 11th hour workers that we started before, we want to look at how God is calling now for these 11th hour workers so that they can receive, at the end of the day of harvest, they can receive a generous, full reward for their service. So reading the rest of this story from Matthew 20, starting in verse 8, we can read, Now when evening came, the owner of the vineyard said to his foreman, Call the workers and pay them their wages, beginning with the last ones hired, and going on to the first. The workers who were hired about the eleventh hour came, and each received a denarius. So when those came who were hired first, they expected they would receive more. But no, each one of them also received a denarius. When they received it, they began to grumble against the landowner. These men who were hired last only worked one hour. We worked through their burden and heat of the day, and you have made them equal to us. But he answered one of them, Friend, I am not being unfair to you. Did not you agree to work for me for the day, for a denarius? Take your pay and go. I want to give to the people who were hired last the same as I gave you. Don't I have the right to do what I want with my own money? Or are you envious because I am generous? So the last will be first, and the first shall be last. Now this story teaches us a wonderful end there. That if we have delayed in responding to God's call, at the beginning of the day, at the beginning of our Christian life, we didn't respond to become soul winners, to serve the Lord, to uh, maybe go to Bible school and uh, maybe become a preacher if that was God's call. Well, if it's the 11th hour and you still respond, 
Christ is still calling for workers, and he can still give a full reward to those who respond. In John chapter 4, verses 35 through 38, our Lord Jesus said, Do you not say there are yet four months, and then comes the harvest? Behold, I say to you, lift up your eyes, look at the fields. They are already white for harvest. And he who reaps receives wages and gathers fruit for eternal life. That both he who sows and he who reaps may rejoice together. For in this the saying is true, one sows and another reaps. I have sent you to reap that for which you had not labored. Others have labored, and you have entered in to their labors. Now, who will respond to God's calling? The day of harvest will soon be over. We must quickly gather the lost souls. Others have planted. Now it is the time to reap. And if you will join the harvest workers at this 11th hour while there's still time, if you will join, you can gain a full reward. Hallelujah. So don't neglect God's call that the Holy Spirit is saying in this season. Don't wait until after the harvest is over. Don't say, well, and maybe in four months it'll be time for harvest. No, you wait. And the day will end up coming when the people will lament. The harvest is past. The summer has ended. And we were not saved. The harvest is past. And the workers were too few. And we were not saved. Don't wait to lead the lost to Christ, the Savior. Because the time is soon coming when Christ will return, not as the Lamb, offering salvation to those who newly welcome him. No, the time will come when he is coming back as the Lion of the tribe of Judah, as the judge of the whole world, as the one who will have ended the day of salvation so that the time of Christ's kingdom on the earth will start for those who had already received his salvation. Don't wait. Let's wholeheartedly respond to God today. Today, if you hear his voice, harden not your heart. No, let us respond and become one of the 11th hour workers. If you have not been diligent as a soul winner, if you have not really been praying for lost souls, If you feel God has a call upon you, even to become a Bible teacher, to become a pastor, and you've just postponed and said, well, maybe next year, maybe in five years I'll go to Bible school. Maybe someday. Someday is soon going to be over. Today, let us respond to what Christ is saying so that Christ may make you even equal to those who have labored for a long time. Many who are first shall be last, and many who are last shall be first. Respond to Christ's generous offer in this 11th hour to give you generous wages and eternal rewards so that you and the people you lead to Christ will forever rejoice in God's eternal kingdom if You respond to God's call today. Today, if you hear his voice, let's respond. Hallelujah! Thank you. God bless you.